Okay, um, welcome everyone to today's Design in Dialogue. Um, today's Zoom will be roughly about 45 minutes long and followed by a Q&A section. We'll be recording this for archive and anyone who's missing this meeting um, so that you, so if you do not wish to be seen on the video, um, feel free to turn off your video um, in the bottom left corner. Um, we are also muting everyone to ensure audio clarity for everyone. Uh, if you want to ask um, Zoe um, and Glenn any questions, please type them in the chat and we will go through them during the Q&A. So let's turn to Glenn and Zoe. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you for joining us this morning, Zoe. Um, just to repeat what Lucy said, do use the chat box because um, we're all friends here and it's nice to use that as a kind of scrolling conversation while Zoe and I are talking. Also, if Zoe mentions anything um, that uh, deserves linking, we might put some URLs in there. So Zoe, thank you for joining us. You're in Chicago. I'm in Chicago. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so you're safe and sound. Uh, I'm safe and sound. Good to see that everybody else is, I hope. Yeah, and so since you are our first curator on the Design and Dialogue series, could you kick us off with a tour of your room? <laughs> yes, we were just talking about this. So this piece here is by Max Bill, who I've always been a big fan of. And I read recently, I mean, he was obviously very committed to, to formalism and, and symbolism. And I love this because it's sort of a unity symbol, obviously a Mobius strip. Um, and I love the colours, um, a good 1970s um, colour scheme. But I read recently that he bought a really early, huge work by Keith Herring, which he had in his house. I know, look at your face, Glenn. I I'm did it. In um, really early piece, huge one that he installed in his house in uh, Switzerland. Um, so I love him even more now because I, and I'm desperate. I'm, I'm doing a lot of research on the, on the 80s and 90s right now. So Keith Herring is in, uh, in my field of vision. So I'm desperate to find out what that connection was. And this one is um, a drawing and collage by Lucy Orta, an artist based in Paris. And it's from her, it's, a, it's the Parachute Project. Um, it's from her Antarctica No Borders Project. Um, that she's been working on for many, many years now um, with her husband, Jorge um, Orta, about, um, about basically Antarctica and a place of, of no borders and what that could possibly mean in um, the world today. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably very apt, um, but also it's, uh, I love the idea that you could do it yourself, parachute um, out of here, <laughs> which I might need, well, we all might need. Yeah, so topical. You're, you're giving me the idea, Zoe, that uh, we should organize a snap exhibition of curators art at their homes. That would be great. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a project for another time. I did want to mention, by the way, that, um, of course, Max Bill was one of the inheritors of the tradition of the Bauhaus because he was very involved in the Hochschule für Gestaltung, am I saying that right, in Ulm? Uh, which was a kind of post-war successor to the Bauhaus. And you, of course, at the Art Institute have a show about the Bauhaus's impact on Chicago obviously can't be seen now, but it would have been in its last month here at... Um, yes. Yeah. Alison Fisher, um, one of the curators in our department, um, curated this incredible exhibition about the Chicago Bauhaus. We are really interested in um, the legacies of obviously Chicago and how the Bauhaus moved to Chicago and then was sort of taken up in, in the city and taken on by people like, of course, Maholi Naj, but others who then um, and many, many women that are under recognized that are in the exhibition. And we just made the decision to extend the exhibition. So hopefully when we open, um, people will be, will get another chance to, to see that show run into the fall. Oh, super. You also had a great show about fiber art that was sort of in the wake of the Bauhaus with Annie Albers and Lenore Tawney and uh, yep. uh, Eisler, a great Chicago type yep. of artist. Yeah. yeah. Beyond yeah. Weaving at the Bauhaus. Yeah. On my colleague Erica. Yeah, no, lots of good, lots of good stuff. So before we get into the uh, work that you've been doing yourself at the Art Institute, can you just say a little bit about how you got into this business in the first place? Um, I know that a lot of people who might be students who are listening in wonder how one becomes a curator, particularly a curator of such stature as yourself. So I'm, nice. I'm, wondering, um, <laughs> I'm wondering what your path was. How did you get to the, to this, uh, idea even of being a curator and trained to do it 
Yeah, I like to think that the path was a bit circuitous because I don't believe in, um, I think you can really rewrite a linear history of how things happened. Um, and mine was definitely not linear, although I, you know, since a very early age, I knew that I wanted to work in museums. Um, I had no idea what a curator was. I think obviously the, the, the term curator has um, taken on all kinds of new definitions in more recent times. Um, but I definitely knew that I wanted to work with artists. I grew up around artists. Um, I grew up going to art museums. Um, my parents were voracious um, cultural buffs, music and art and and so that was sort of just in my DNA and I was really, really drawn to that. Um, and I knew that I was really interested in what exhibitions did, that they positioned points of view and they brought together really incredible bodies of work. Um, and, you know, I think at the beginning it was, it was quite, um, I didn't know how to really set out on that path. I um, studied art history at Sussex University and I remember my grandparents staging an intervention when I decided that I was going to study art history and saying, oh no, 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 she must study law or, you know, one of the kind of, you know, what they felt was going to get me a proper job. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, my, par my parents then um, sort of persuaded them that, no, I, I, let, let's see how she goes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I've persevered, as they as they say. Um, I after when I was at Sussex University, I did a um, voluntary work at the at the VNA, um, and I had a really amazing mentor there, Margaret Timmers, mm -hmm. who um, I did some research for, and she was the one that basically said, you know, this environment is so um, competitive that you must do more, you know, just get more experience. And of course, I thought, how am I going to do that in such a competitive environment? Um, and not a great economic environment when I left university. And I had always been enamored with New York for many reasons, not just Desperately Seeking Susan and other other films that were sort of high on my agenda as a- Oh, as a oh can I interrupt? Did you identify more with Madonna or Rosanna Arquette? Oh no, Madonna for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real bifurcation. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, Madonna, although I, you know, I probably felt that I was more like Arquette. I was, I was a Rosanna. You know, at, yeah. certainly at that age, yeah. <laughs> today, yeah. Anyway, carry on. So then you went to New York. Well, yeah, and I think because I was so drawn to New York, and for some reason I just didn't want to go as a tourist. I really wanted to work there. I had always thought of myself as being a professional and, and working but ever since I was little. All my kind of games that we played with my sister were about working. <laughs> doing jobs and being a teacher or working in a museum or doing something um, and so I went I applied to do an internship and I actually um, at the Guggenheim and at MoMA and I chose MoMA because um, and at that time they chose the department that you were going to be in and they chose architecture and design um, because they told me that the curator at that time had just taken on an exhibition and we had three months to curate it and I thought this sounded crazy um, but I had to jump at this opportunity. Little did I know that I would meet Paola Antonelli. This is now 20 years ago um, and as people that know Paola um, the show was Project 66 with Campana Brothers and Ingo Maurer and I know oh, you right. have one of the Campana Brothers um, on the on Umberto your Campana this Friday yes. And, um, and other people will know that you know Paola is a um, I like to think of her as a very benevolent white witch. And I think she sort of hypnotized me or something, but told me that I must stay in architecture and design um, and that she would, would help me sort of carve my, my path. And she absolutely did that. And I hopefully have lived up to her, um, her high expectations as she set me on this journey. Um, and from there, I did a number of things in New York, but, um, the, the most, um, I think, game changing for me was the six or seven years that I was at the Van Allen Institute, mm -hmm. um, which was a, it is still a very small but feisty nonprofit about um, improving the design of the public realm. Um, and I think I was very fortunate to start at a small institution where you can really cut your teeth and, and really experiment. And I was I'm very encouraged by the then director, Ray Gastel. 
to build their exhibitions program and to edit their quarterly journal. And it was, you know, I started in 2000 and in 2001, of course, we had um, September the 11th and we did a lot of projects around that, about rebuilding the city, um, about memory, um, and a lot of collaborations with the create with Creative Time, the Public Art Fund, different universities. And I think that was really seminal, that idea of collaboration, pulling projects together, working across different disciplines, architecture, design, arts. Mm. But that meant that by the time that you had really uh, gotten into the field, you had worked at both extremely large ex uh, institutions, MoMA and the VNA, and also in these much smaller kind of speedboat, more nimble institution. Mm -hmm. So that was an ideal training, I suppose, for you in lots of ways. And then you got to the Art Institute, what, 12 years ago, something like that? 13 years ago 13? now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so was was that uh, into your present job or did you have to kind of climb the ranks in, this, in the Art Institute as well? So I was hired by the then chair, Joe Rosa, to be the first curator oh, of design. Oh, oh. And it was um, when the department oh. was changing its name from architecture to architecture and design. So that was in 2006 when I arrived. And the, really the mandate was to build their design collection. At that time, just 1980 to the present, and obviously start to do exhibitions about design, which they hadn't been doing. Um, and again, I mean, it was, you know, I, I, I call my route quite circuitous because it wasn't that I was working in, you know, design before that either. Um, so it was a complete crash course. Um, when I when I came in terms of, you know, contemporary design, I'd, I'd gone to Salone, the Milan Furniture Fair a couple of times, fortunately, and had been kind of involved in that in that world, um, but definitely hadn't curated graphic design show, which was my first exhibition at the, um, mm. at the Art Institute. Um, but again, just started sort of really collaborating with others and, and reaching out oh. and, do, and doing a lot of research and, and learning. Um, to try and to also try and figure out how would contemporary design sit within a place like like the Art Institute. Mm. And so now that you've been there for over a decade, do you have thoughts about how design does sit in the larger scope of this comprehensive museum? I mean, you're down the hall from Seurat's Grand Jatte and all the rest of it, um, Grand Woods, American Gothic. So how do you get design to register uh, sufficiently? And do you feel like you curate differently because of that broader context? I mean, fundamentally, I'm interested in ideas and the conceptual underpinnings of, of architecture and design. So, and I, you know, what I enjoy most about working at the Art Institute is that our work sits amongst, you know, thousands of years of creative practice. So as you move through the Art Institute, you're, you're also moving through many different disciplines. It's not that there's you know, necessarily just painting galleries or sculpture galleries, although um, you do move through those. There's lots of, you know, there's lots of different departments now are much more, you know, doing installations which are much more interdisciplinary. Um, but I also think it makes a big difference that we're in Chicago. I mean, this is a architecture and design town. Mm -hmm. um, we have a hungry, very knowledgeable um, audience um, who've always been, you know, very influential and, and in my work. Um, so there's always been tremendous support for the work that we've done. I think at the beginning, people were very nervous about design joining the uh, joining the pack um, because it is such a strong architecture city. Um, and in many ways, it, you know, when I first came, it was very traditional and more conservative. And um, we've, you know, spent a lot of time doing different kinds of projects to open up different conversations and dialogues. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, that we are a, a department of modern and contemporary architecture and design. So we, um, we sort of, are, and now we have collection galleries that run 1900, roughly 1900 to the present. And I think that makes a huge difference. Um, very prominent galleries in the modern wing that opened in 2009. Um, and really, I think, put the department on the map, gave it much more visibility than it had before, just by sort of location. And we're sort of located also by the coffee shop. So by the time the people are really exhausted from going around a, an almost a million square feet, which is the museum, they might take a break and then hopefully we can attract them fresh, uh, freshly caffeined into, uh, into architecture and design. 
it's one of the l little known facts about museum curators. You always want your galleries to be by the coffee shop. <laughs> or the now I will only work with the gallery spaces next to coffee shop. Well, let's let's uh, go ahead and start looking at some images, Lucy. If you can queue up the PowerPoint, because we're going to start with some images of those galleries. Um, I suppose we should also put in a word for the School of the Art Institute. Yes, which is so desk. so important and really. Um, I think is one of the obviously one of the biggest assets of, of, of the museum that we have a, a you know a school of an art school attached to it and we can sort of share and pool knowledge and actually one of the pieces that we're looking at right now uh, the black um, stool on this image by Norman Teague um, who is a, a designer in Chicago and actually one of his professors, uh, former professors, Helen Maria Nugent is on the, uh, is on this call. Um, but Norman actually uh, went to, um, went to the School of the Art Institute and this was one of his um, graduate projects. Um, and he's a fantastic designer. So, you know, we, we get a lot of inspiration and, um, and insight from, from having obviously the, the School of the Art Institute attached. And, and we teach, you know, I teach and several people in my department teach, which, you know, is really, I think, important to our practice. That's a brilliant pairing with the Castiglione, is that, mm -hmm. the, the, you get this sort of uh, comparison to the simple line of the curve, but then the two pieces are so different in their affect and the way that they uh, kind of work with materiality, like one is very, very crafted, the Teague is very crafted, and the Castiglione is much more industrial, found object oriented. Yeah, but still, you know, I think what's so interesting about Norman's piece is um, Norman and I continue to have many, many conversations, and I lean on him a lot for helping me to, you know, we have a commitment to more equitable, more diverse, more um, inclusive. Um, projects, so trying to move away from linear narratives, as I said before in the collection, much more networked types of um, connections um, and, 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 you know, more projects from diverse geographies, um, cultures and um, more women and more people of color, you know, designs by people of color. And I think what's interesting about this project and what I think I'm trying to grapple with at the moment is it's not enough to just put, um, you know, almost Norman's piece by this Castiglione piece. Of course, you know, I want Norman's work to be seen within the history of, of design. It deserves to be there, but it's almost, it's, it's got so many other things that are important to it. And I'm grappling with the idea that the history of design is so limited right now, the way it's been written. Mm. And we really need to open that up. And one of the things I think is so interesting about Norman's piece is, of course, he's looking at the history of design and he's looking at people like um, Castiglione brothers. But increasingly, he's also really interested in what does it mean to be um, a designer of color, a black designer, mm. working, you know, with reference points that are, um, this piece is called the Simmi Stool, which is um, in the Yoruba um, language um, means to relax. And it was actually inspired by, um, people, you know, how they behave um, when, they're, when they're in the city, when they're in urban environments, you know, leaning against a car or um, perching on a wall, and you sort of lean up against it and you have to kind of take a leap of faith because the thing does, you know, swing back. But he found like the more people did it, they actually then assume different positions leaning against it. And I'm sure this was a very um, complex piece to uh, work on when he was a, a student. I know that he grappled a lot with it, but I find it very interesting that, you know, as, as well as the history of design, he was also looking at music, the kind of cultural references from the south side of Chicago. Um, and alongside this piece, we added the sketches of this design, which are annotated and they have a few of the um, kind of some of the um, things that he was looking at as part of the um, obviously these sketches and I think it helps a little bit to kind of um, open up this piece and, and explain more about what it's about but I think for me this is this piece is just sort of the beginnings of my own interest in how do we open up I guess the history of design and use our collection galleries as kind of a testing space for um, you know trying to make more complex um, approaches to these histories, but also more interdisciplinary. Mm. Um, 
kind yeah. of conversations and narratives. As opposed to some extent, one has to find designers that one can follow. Like the curator can't do the work on their own. You need to find designers who are intellectual partners effectively. So it's interesting to see the mention of, for example, King Saniade, the Afro beat, you know, star there, which you would never initially associate with that object. But um, Lucy, maybe if you can go back to the object itself, it has this wonderfully honed down compressed quality that obviously only comes from a designer focusing their attention on a form for a long period of time so to me it suggests also a rocking horse and a saddle to Absolutely. Just in, um, language but also has that kind of um, rootedness in the urban fabric that you mentioned so just that multiplicity of the design is quite extraordinary isn't it Oh, well, I, and I love, you know, we don't want to, that's the thing with interpretation. You want to give some hints and clues. But, you know, other, you know, I've, I've taken groups around. People have thought this is a sex toy. They <laughs> thought this is, um, yeah, absolutely. Or a children's toy. Um, definitely the rocking horse. You know, the other interesting thing is in the galleries, it's when you look through, you see this piece. And as you look through, you look through to the um, Charles and Rain's um, bent plywood um, splint on the other side. I don't think you can see it on these images. Um, and it's made from bent plywood. So it's obviously, you know, it's looking back, Norman's looking back to the history of, of mm. modernism. Um, so it's, you know, there's so much that can be read through this, you know, one, um, one object. Yeah, it's is, the kind of, um, it's the marvel and challenge of curatorial work that, it, you know, <laughs> develop these narratives around all the, and you must have thousands of objects under your care, I would, I would think by now, no? We have a quarter of a million. Right, that's many thousands. So well, you have 75 words for a label, so you really can only <laughs> say so much. <laughs> but that's why all these additional means of engagement are so important, I guess. And I suppose that leads us neatly onto the question of the temporary exhibition as a form, because there you can go much more in depth into an artist's or designer's work. And so we just, um, out of many options, we've just uh, picked out three, um, two of which are past and one of which is coming up. So first, I wanted to ask you about the series of monographic exhibitions that you've been doing um, over the past years using this example uh, as a kind of case study, the work of Christine Mendertsma, the uh, Dutch designer. So could you tell us a little bit about her practice and also how this fits into the overarching program that you've been leading at the Art Institute? Yeah, so Christine's project, um, Everything Connects, her show was the second in our new Frankie Harrow uh, design series. Um, and we have a really incredible um, supporter, Jay Frankie, who I've talked to a lot. He's, he's very knowledgeable about design. He's in Chicago. Um, you know, when you find some, someone that's really knowledgeable about design and, and really excited, you kind of hold on to them. And, and we have really fantastic conversations. And one of the things that I talked to him about was the fact that I really wanted a, an annual program where we could celebrate and, and um, start conversations around um, d different types of design talent. So for, for this, we've done, uh, we're on our third exhibition and they've all been, um, the third one will be about a collective, um, but the first two, Max Lamb and now Christine, um, were solo shows and we'll see how they sort of evolve as we go, as we go forward. Um, but it's given us an opportunity to have a, a space for um, really collaborating with an individual or a collective around contemporary design issues, but also just to ask, you know, what is, what is design today? What are the types of practices that, that people are working in and the types of issues that they're addressing? Um, and I've been a huge fan of Christine's work since um, the Pig 05049 book came out in 2007, I believe. Um, and I've kind of followed her career since then. And we talked actually for quite a few years. I mean, a lot of these projects were kind of in development for, for a while before we then um, we presented them, really about what would um, having the space for this exhibition and obviously the, the museum um, resources behind it, what would that help um, her with and for actually for Christine she was really interested in in showing just two projects this one Fibre Market which actually was developed for the Design Museum in London um, and her Flax project and really going into depth with these two projects and presenting them for the first time in the States um, she hadn't had a solo show at that point in the in the United States 
Um, and it was just, you know, it's a real joy to work with someone. I'm really interested in her because of her practices, so research based, um, which I think really defines her, her practice. Mm, I was just thinking of that too, because design research is a perhaps overused phrase. And I, in fact, associate it uh, quite strongly with the group in Chicago around design issues journal, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but what Christine does seems to me very special in that it's very research driven, but also very material oriented. And she thinks a lot about commodity flows and chains mm -hmm. and the way that materiality sort of passes through our hands. Um, and also has a very strong affinity to craft as well as to industrial processes and really thinks about the entire scope of that um, in a way that feels very urgent and necessary right now. She just seems like a very topical designer to me. How did you go about choosing her for the series? Like, how, how does that process of selection work for you? Does it have to do with topicality or? I mean, I don't know if we're, we're necessarily... Um you know, it's so much about, you, you want to be relevant. You're trying to choose projects which you think are relevant at this moment. But I was also trying to choose projects that would really open um, conversations around design. What is design? What do designers do? Um, use these, these exhibitions really as, as also as, as teaching tools um, for our learning and public engagement department but also when we're sort of you know taking tour groups through but also one of the things i loved about christine was i think her work has such a light touch in many ways what the, the results of it and it's less you know for her i don't think you know that it's not that the outcome is the most important thing so the chair the flax chair or the textiles that she makes of course they're they're beautiful in their own right but they're a way for her to illustrate her ideas. So in actual fact, I mean, she's choosing an object or an outcome that's just sort of a, um, a vehicle for her to kind of explain her ideas. But more importantly for me was just trying to get people to understand um, how persistent, how ambitious, how persuasive, how, I mean, all the things that Christine has to use to get behind and behind the scenes in a really hardcore industry. Mm. So how do you, um, you know, really access the farming industry um, or the cosmetics industry or textile industry? And the fact that she's been able to, through her projects, get access to some of these um, incredibly proprietary, secretive, um, private kind of kind of industries to really try and unlock elements for example this project just because this image is up obviously the fiber market was really you know on the has so many facets to it but one of which is so interesting is just how difficult it is to be sustainable just mm -hmm. how difficult it is to actually recycle you know if you don't know what the material content is i mean this project was about the fact that she'd found these new um machines in in the netherlands um where you could sort material by sort fabric by its material content um and so she um asked a secondhand um company for a thousand secondhand sweaters and sent them through this machine and the majority that came back that weren't on the label it said 100 percent wool and the majority that, that actually came back 100 percent wool was very minimal so on the back wall you're seeing little samples and she she has um annotated actually the kind of the, the woolen content sometimes no woolen con content sometimes a percentage um, and I don't think, you know, it's not necessarily that she's trying to take different specific brands or um, to task, but the industry as a whole, that there's so many processes, fabric and materials are sent all over the world to, to be processed and washed and, and, and to make, you know, one garment. Um, but in any one of those processes, there could have been contamination. Mm. Um, but obviously we have, you know, there's a huge issue here if we are to be, you know, if we're thinking about things as recycling as a, as a way of being sustainable. Um, and I just, you know, I love how her projects raise incredibly serious, deep um, issues. Um, but the way that she goes about it is, is very, um, it's very illustrative. Um, yeah, just beautiful presentations that, that provide sort of almost like a toolkit for you to then be able to kind of take people through some of her ideas. 
You know, just to share one anecdote um, before we move on to the next project that really bears out what you're saying about the toolkit and the kind of teachability of this material. <clears throat> Last time I was at the Art Institute, the show was still on and I saw a school group walking through and one of the questions that came forward from the school group was, do you think the curator considers herself to be part of the commodity chain of this work? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. But I sort of wanted to intercede and said, I, I think she probably does. <laughs> you know? But I'm they were absolutely com complicit, yeah. The, they were they were reading your your text panel with great attention. I can tell you. <laughs> um, let's good. move on to the next project, which is in a cloud. Just um, a few more shots of this installation by Christine Mandertsma. So in a cloud, in a wall, in a chair, a, a, a title that I have great, as you know, I have great reverence and even envy that you managed to get this title at the <laughs> restaurant at the Art Institute, a testament to your own persuasiveness. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have too long to discuss this very large and ambitious and important project, but can you tell us a little bit about what it sought to achieve? Yes, so I mean, this is a, I mean, a project that now is so dear to me for so many reasons, but I think it's very emblematic of, you know, when you asked me earlier on about being a, being a curator, um, I think one of the things that was so interesting when I came to the Art Institute was this idea that you were, you were meant to be the kind of all-knowing um, expert mm. and to sort of somehow sort of, you know, get from within you all the knowledge and impart that to other people single-handedly. And I found this just so bizarre and also absurd that you would, you know, we would know, you know, know all of this. And there are people that are, you know, real scholars, Glenn, you're one of them in, in so many areas. And I guess I just felt, you know, that I was, you know, my, my knowledge was so wanting in so many areas. Um, and when you are working at a small institution, it really behooves you to collaborate, to pull resources, brain power and others. And so my, my methodologies at the Art Institute have really been the same. I've, I've always collaborated with others and, and got insights from others on any projects. And this one is, of course, you know, I, when I'd first gone to Mexico, I was invited a number of years ago to be on a, um, on a design jury. And I was just so, um, so incredibly, um, you know, I loved Mexico City. I knew why people kept telling me to go there. Um, I found the environment so rich and culturally diverse and, and so cosmopolitan. Um, and I, but I just kept thinking, why do I know nothing about, or like so little, I knew about Clara Posset, but I knew so little about her and, and her work and, um, and the history of modern design. And I felt before I could do a project really about kind of contemporary practice, which is what I, I wanted to do when I went there, and then maybe I should look through sort of the history of, of modern design. And I went to the archive with Anna Elena Malay, who's a, a great curator in Mexico. And then she, to, and I realized that, you know, obviously the, the body of work that Clara Posset had. Um, and then Anna Elena became obviously a key curatorial partner on this project. But one of the key things about this exhibition, which looks at six figures, was the network of relationships how they, you know, all informed one another. And it was really because of one another that they all um, could really, you know, move their practices forward. And they worked as this network. So Clara Posset, um, Lola Alvarez Bravo, the photographer, uh, Clara Posset is a furniture and interior designer. Um, Cynthia Sargent, textile designer. This is some of photo, uh, the photo montages that punctuate the show from Lola Alvarez Bravo, which show you the kind of country, the uh, Mexico in the 40s and 50s, really undergoing rapid industrialization. Um, and the country really coming out of a time of, you know, revolution and trying to try and understand itself within this kind of modern period. And Clara Posset doing all these exhibitions and, um, which you see images at, at the end of all the incredible work that was going on in the, in the country. And the most important thing was that, you know, Clara Posset was a, a real modernist, but she knew that for, for what made Mexico unique was its kind of burgeoning industry, but also this tie, this incredible rich um, expertise in craft practices and handmade work. So the kind of bringing that together. So that's why Ruth Asawa, the sculptures in the show, Annie Albers um, and Cynthia, Cynthia Sargent um, and uh, Sheila Hicks. And they're all in some way connected. And I think for me, it was, it's, 
It was a show about setting the record straight, making better known Mexico as a, as a really vibrant site of modern art and design. Um, it was a show about asking questions about the complexities of curatorial exchange, um, which of course is you know, extremely complex. And it was a show also, I think, at a time where, you know, if you were reading headlines in the US, you were not thinking of Mexico as a place of ambitious migration to Mexico, but just as a place where everybody was leaving Mexico. And of course, this is not true now. And it was definitely not true during the modern period. I mean, Mexico City was like Paris in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. I mean, all the intellectuals and intelligentsia were, were there or had moved through it at some point. Um, really benefiting from this incredible, um, yeah, openness to to conversations and artistic practice as a way to um, move a country forward. And I found this, yeah, I found this fascinating. You know, one of the things I loved about the show was, um, which you've alluded to already, is the mirroring between the show that we were looking at at the Art Institute and the moment that you were documenting. So that there was this kind of international team that put the exhibition together. And also, as you say, that there was a kind of political urgency to the exhibition that mirrored the political urgency that might have existed in Mexico in mid-century. So it felt like there, it was a very good example of curatorial practice drawing uh, connections between the historical moment and the present moment in a way that felt very important and necessary at that time. There's the beautiful installation of the Ruth Asawa sculptures, of course. And she's a great example because she was actually inspired to make these famous sculptures by vernacular crafts that she found in Mexico, correct? Yes, and she took a class with Clara Posset on crafts and housing. And it was Clara Posset that said to her, you know, she saw something in her. Ruth Asara only went to Mexico twice, but she saw something in her. And, and Ruth credits Clara with saying, you know, you should go to um, Black Mountain College. Um, and you should meet my, you know, good friends there, Joseph and, and Annie Albers, which she did and of course learned tremendously from particularly Joseph Albers. You know, we have her drawings, her studies that she was working on when she was at Black Mountain College. But also again, this, this idea, you know, Black Mountain College was a place, you know, that was, ex you know, extremely poor. Um, you know, there's all these anecdotes of Joseph Albers saying, you know, just sort of get outside and find leaves, find things, you know, outside for inspiration and then coming back and using these to, you know, in the end, create really incredible works. And I think what, you know, in terms of the Ruth Asawa's work, she saw these wire egg baskets in Toluca in Mexico City and obviously was really inspired by that technique. Um, but also I think would have been drawn to wire because it was an industrial industrial material readily available you know relatively inexpensive but then really took that technique and, and made it something her own with these you know these incredible incredible works and one could tell a similar story about uh sheila hicks in fact also an albers related story because hicks had studied with joseph albers and had sort of transiently met annie albers mm -hmm. uh, at yale and then went down to mexico city and found herself in a real center of artistic and art architectural exchange there. And you are part of the collaboration, Glenn, because you graciously wrote the, uh, the essay on, uh, yeah, fantastic essay on Sheila Hicks. Well, I can say that Sheila Hicks is a mighty good interview. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Anybody that gets to spend time with Sheila Hicks yeah. is, uh, I mean, you're just blessed. It's just but also, um, it's just last word on this show, Cynthia Sargent also, who I had not even heard of before, um, is another, this is the Sheila Hicks room here. But if you go back actually by one slide, Lucy, um, we see Cynthia Sargent's work. Can you say a little bit about her? Because she was a real discovery, I think, for many people in the show. Yeah, and I, t I give all credit to, to Anna Elena for Cynthia Sargent. I mean, she is a huge fan of hers. Um, and, um, and I became a, a big fan. I think Cynthia um, was a New Yorker and with Wendell Riggs, her husband, they moved to Mexico City in 1951 and met Clara Posset and she put their work in her exhibition Art in Daily Life in 1952 and they sort of credit Clara Posset with helping them kind of give them a platform to their work but they moved primarily because they found the New York art world 
um, to be quite dismissive of crafts practices and the types of things they wanted to do. And they were able to set up their own workshop um, and develop, you know, they, they developed a thriving business and had a store in New York, but also one in um, Acapulco. What's interesting though, and I think perhaps the most, um, sort of their, the most important thing about their legacy was they were the ones that um, they co-founded the Bazaar Sabado, which continues to this day, which is uh, the Saturday market, the crafts market, which was the first place where there was a really serious place for artisans to show their work. And there was, you know, artisans from all over the world would show at the Bazaar Sabado. Um, and as its name suggests, the only prerequisite was that you had to be sort of on your booth on a Saturday and uh, meet your public and talk about your work while you were, you know, hoping that people would, would buy it. And I, I think, yeah, I think this, this obviously has had a really incredible place in, in Mexico's um, mm -hmm. their history. Um, you know, just before we move on, one last comment on this show is just that it, it seems retrospectively very poignant, this story about international connections at a time when we're all isolated and speaking to each other like this. Obviously, it's great we can speak to each other like this and in some way keep the discourse going, which is what the Design and Dialogue series is intended to do. But it really uh, shows you what we're being prevented from doing, which is to gather in these very unpredictable configurations. And nowhere was that truer obviously then at uh, mid-century in Mexico, that's for sure. Um, let's just finish up by talking about one forthcoming project. So this is a bit of a sneak preview. preview. Um, and uh, Zoe, you're gonna uh, bring the work of this, um, this very uh, experimental and interesting group called the Ambiguous Standards Institute to this the Art Institute um, this fall, I guess, is that right? Yes, we were meant to open this in May, and now we've um, we've moved the show to November, um, and it's the third in the Frankie Harrow Design Series. Um, and um, Ambiguous Standards Institute, actually, the two co-founders, um, John Zhu Sojan and Avshar Gurnapa, are. Um, I met them when I was curating the Istanbul Design Biennial and actually commissioned to do, them to do a project then. They did a project about Twitter and, and social media um, then. But I um, hadn't realized that that year they'd started this um, pseudo institute, the Ambiguous Standards Institute. And again, like Christine, are really committed to kind of deep research based, um, research based practice. And then I saw um, they had um, been included in. Um, the Istanbul Design Biennial in 2018 with their research um, and they're really interested in sort of interrogating how standards develop, how they, um, you know, what, what impacts kind of the standards, everything from obviously electricity to time to the food industry to health standards. Um, how they develop and then obviously how they impact the kind of products that get made because of, of new standards um, and also our interactions, how they sort of impact interactions between humans and, and others. Mm -hmm. um, and they use their sort of very Deutsche um, Volkbund approach where they create, um, I think we have some installation views from the, from the time they were shown in Istanbul um, in 2018, but they um, develop sort of crates within which they you know, do a, um, an analysis of lots of different objects or gestures um, or instruments that are instruments of, of standards or, and then, then show sort of obviously how the ambiguities, there's always um, ambiguities in standards, you know, here obviously an egg, you know, an egg slicer, um, which, you know, to make them, you know, the most perfect slices of an egg, here is a project about um, about gestures um, as a universal form of communication, which I guess will be now that we're not allowed to shake hands anymore. I hear we're obviously waving will become, I guess, our our new form of um, of saying hello. And this is, um, you know, even things from the eggs or you know different types of eggs. And they sort of take different case studies. And I I I found the project to be really laced with a lot of humour and irony even though obviously the topic is, you know, is so serious. Um, and they call themselves institutions. This is Jan Zhu. And they've made us a, a new introductory video and really expanded the project. There will be 10 different case studies really looking at, at, at standards. 
Um, and I'm, you know, again, I'm interested in this. They are a collective working together. There's many, many that are um, part of the Institute. Um, but the idea of setting up this, this research platform, um, I found an interesting, um, an interesting project for us to explore at the Art Institute. I, I guess it also uh, raises the question of the polymorphous nature of design now, because you could easily imagine a visitor wandering into that show and thinking that it's a conceptual art project, mm -hmm. and in a way they wouldn't be wrong. Mm -hmm. And I suppose um, it just prompts the question of how you're exchanging with your colleagues at the Art Institute in contemporary art and other fields that seem not just contingent to contemporary design, but maybe even to start start folding themselves into contemporary design. How do you understand the positioning of a project like this one within the broader offer of contemporary art at the institution? I think I'm always very conscious of how our work sits within, within the Art Institute. And again, for me, I think I am, you know, because I'm much more interested in the conceptual underpinnings, I'm less, I'm less interested in sort of connoisseurship, connoisseurship of an object mm. as I am about how objects sit within the world. So the kind of cultural, social, um, political, you know, implications of objects. And so for me, you know, there's these sort of um, cases or these case studies. Um, yes, they, they could very much sit next to um, uh, Robert Gover or a Klaus Oldenburg or, a, you know, other designers that um, other artists that have been really interested in exploring kind of the everyday, which is something I'm also, you know, very interested in very, you know, the everyday, but here becoming absolutely unordinary because, you know, through over specification, we're looking at these, all these tools for the for the kitchen, obviously through over specification. Um, you know, you are creating something quite unusual or unique. So, which mm. isn't, you know, which goes beyond the idea of just the general standard. Um, and I think some of the some of the issues that we address in our projects, oh, all, you know, the the issues inherent in them, there are so many overlaps with our colleagues. Um, mm. and I benefit enormously from working with our colleagues. I mean, for example, the Inner Cloud exhibition. Um, Anne Goldstein, who's our head of modern and contemporary art, I mean, she was invaluable in helping me install the Ruth Asawas, for example, mm -hmm. and having someone with a, you know, with with her um, art eyeballs to and, and brain to really help me with that. Whereas I'm, you know, I'm committed to these these projects as as design first. Um, and you know, through the lens of design, I know that they can be read in in all kinds of ways. And I think that's you know that's just even better, mm. and and adds to the kind of yeah the, the many layers of interpretation that's possible when you put something in a in a museum like ours. Yeah, one of the first things you said when we started talking, Zoe, was that you're interested primarily in the ideas that design yeah. brings to the table, and this seems like a very good example of that. And I suppose. One way of thinking about it is that design is a kind of specific conceptual apparatus that allows you to understand the world around you in a particular way. So even if it creates some of the same kind of abstracting or distancing effects that contemporary art might, you know, sort of making the everyday strange, for example, getting you to see it in a new way, it does have some particular features and I guess ideas that are proper to it or that just slosh around in the design field more actively, and sort of a more dynamic way than you might elsewhere. And that's one reason that it seems like it does deserve its own distinct perch at a place like the Art Institute. Um, so thanks for bringing these projects to us. I think we have just a few minutes for questions. So maybe we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, if anybody out there has a question for Zoe, now is a good time to ask it. So we have a first question from Alona Gaynor. Alona. <laughs> Hi, Alona. Do you want to um, go ahead and ask, not just in chat, but with your actual voice? <laughs> Hang on a minute. I'm just turning it on. Great. Um, so, yeah. how in the uh, the institute? How have they, or or have they relayed to you the ways in which the taxonomy or groups of objects are curated? Is it via time of affordance, or is it something else? Good question. So in, 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 you know, we're all quite um, independent in our own areas and we, we have a lot of auto autonomy, which is, is great. And, um, you know, 
I do feel, you know, the director really is very supportive. So for us, I think one of the things that um, stands out for our galleries, which our uh, modern and contemporary architecture and design galleries opened in 2017, is that there is a loose chronology. So we are time-based, but 1900 to the present, um, but we're issue driven. So we are, um, it's not about monographic exhibitions. It's not oh no, sorry, Zoe. I meant, um, I meant the newest project that you're putting in exhibition, the one that we were just looking at, is how have they began to group and form those objects? Oh, ambiguous standards? Sorry, yes, yes. Well, actually, I think Janzu and, and uh, Janzu and Afshar are on here because I don't want to speak. Yeah, Afshar Abs just raised, uh, used the raised hand <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> mechanism. Can we can do yeah, Let's talk together. Do you mind, Afshar and Janzu? No, thanks for having us. Hi, Afshar. Oh, hi, Janzu. Hi, how are hi. you? Hi. Hi. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, actually, um, our, our working methods are also quite ambiguous, I should say. Uh, there is not one fixed uh, way of working or um, um, constituting uh, a crate. Sometimes uh, the issue comes first, um, uh, like, uh, for example, the, the tea glasses. We were thinking about the ambiguous standards of, of portion. So what is one tea glass? What's the volume of it? And so the uh, objects came later on uh, when we have discovered that we actually have hundreds of different uh, tea glasses, like these are the standard tea glasses, but they're all so different from each other uh, in means of shape, uh, machine produced or hand produced or the volume. Uh, but sometimes the, uh, the object comes first we uh, look at an object and say like, okay, this, uh, this object measures time like a sand clock, but it's ex actually not accurate, but it's uh, enough accurate for us. So although it's ambiguous, uh, it's, it does not matter um, how flawed it is. But then we start to think about the objects which are fragmented, fragmenting time, measuring time, um, um, noticing, giving us notice about uh, time, the, the whole duration issue, then we start to collect uh, objects. So usually they are not fixed on a certain categorization done by an, like an historian or an anthropologist or whatsoever. Uh, it kind of follows its own flow. Mm. Mm, thank you. Chansi, do you want to add to that? Well, just um, maybe a minor, I think. Uh, sometimes we are depending on our uh, local culture uh, heavily, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, just like a re recent example would be this. Um, for example, now we are experiencing this social distancing. Uh, probably in the US, you are calling this as six feet. Uh, here we are calling it uh, as two meters. Mm -hmm. Few people think about it as one meter is enough, or uh, some of them just uh, measure it by their uh, walking. <laughs> so um, many ambiguities arise from such a simplistic um, regulation in our daily lives. So uh, it's not always object dependent, but it's, um, let's say, depends on the culture, their um, or people's uh, reactions, uh, preferences of using interacting things uh, or each other so i would I would say that's all about it mm. so in some ways what you're trying to show is the qualitative aspects of quantitative measuring and standardization yeah and we are mixing both actually uh, when we saw something a quality which is qualitative uh, and we try to calculate it, like in the cases of tea glasses, uh, you've been served one portion uh, with using a specific tea glass, but it depends on where you consume it. Actually, some of the tea glasses are so small, you are paying the same amount of money for half of the beverage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's, um, it's all related with design, the mass production, um, and culture and uh, everyday life we are experiencing all together. Right. 
Great, thanks guys. It's so it's fantastic to have the artists here, as it were, if here is the word I want. <laughs> um, it's like having a, a gallery talk in the museum, that's not <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, Zoe, also that if you're thinking about standardization, in a way, what you're thinking about there is one of the key questions about modernity itself. So mm -hmm. how did modern science, modern architecture, mm -hmm. modern design in the broadest mm -hmm. sense come to be? Well, partly it was through a kind of application of exactitude and precision that hadn't existed before, which has everything to do with the industrial revolution, blah, blah, blah. But you're, you're raising a theme there that of course could be related to many of the objects in the permanent collection as well. Yeah, and I think this idea of, you know, that, that all progress is good, which I, you know, like to question. Um, but the, you know, the also the, you know, especially in the US context, maximum efficiency, which is always, you know, touted as, as good. And, you know, I think, you know, when you think about standardization, it's, it's a way to organize, you know, an increasingly complex world. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about things that I've learned about recently, like, um, for example, the one that I love, the, the case study is about health and diagnosis mm -hmm. and the standards for um, giving, you know, where, how much pain you have, you know, on a scale from one to 10. And of course, you know, men and women and children, everybody perceives pain quite differently. So how do then that standard relate to kind of these, um, these very human ways that we sort of, you know, relate to the world? Um, and I think, you know, for it, I find this fascinating. Um, so for example, you know, if you think about that, um, one of the things that we had in the, in the um, actually on view right now is a brief history of the breast pump. Mm. And, um, you know, the first one that was, was actually made, and I worked on this project with great help from Michelle Miller Fisher, who's a, a curator um, now in Boston. Um, and one of the things I found so fascinating was it wasn't until the mid 50s that they actually stopped looking at bovine, but actually looked to human beings and, and women in particular to try and figure out, you know, what would be the best approach to this. But something as, you know, as seemingly as, you know, when we when you show objects like that and we show a brief history, so we go all the way to the, the hands free breast pump that just came out a couple of years ago. Um, and it's not to necessarily do what we used to do, which was to say, these are the best examples, you know, you normally come to the museum and people are saying these are the best examples and, and why for me I'm not sure these are the best examples but they're really incredible examples that are about yes the object themselves but about familial leave policies about women's reproductive rights about um, the formula markets you know they raise all kinds of questions just in that one object and obviously standards of health and healthcare, which of course is a, a burning topic for us in in the yeah. us right now and i think the same with you know those are those are kind of standardized objects um but they bear lots of correlations with the work that obviously ambiguous standards is doing looking at a much broader range of of objects but mm -hmm. i'm fascinating how you know when you take these different case studies obviously they raise so many uh, so many different issues um, depending on what your viewpoint and where you're standing in the, in the world. Can I just ask one last question before we close? Um, you had said that your uh, formation was partly under the wing of Paula Antonelli at MoMA and I recognize a lot of what you're saying is having something to do with what she does at, at you know her institution and thinking about design as systems um, or design as a kind of conceptual practice that's not necessarily something that you can um, put in a museum just by buying an object that you need to undertake more complex strategies. Do you think that there's actually a tension between curating design as a set of ideas and curating design as a set of objects? You've, we've been talking about it as sort of design as engaging with conceptual aspects of design on one hand and curating as a way of engaging with um, connoisseurship. Mm -hmm. so what do you think about that tension and how do you balance it in your own work? I don't, I mean, I like that. I mean, I'm interested in all those tensions. I'm interested in, you know, but I'm also interested in, in objects that really are, you know, that can also be beautiful, that can also be, you know, really material rich, that can, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious that of what we're showing. And it needs to really speak to an audience. Um, and I think the, the thing that we, I work on a lot when I work with contemporary practitioners is just thinking about what are we going to show? 
Mm. What is the exhibition? What is the, what is the work? Um, and really developing that together, I think that is quite different to, um, maybe from, from working with artists, but maybe not, because I think there are curators that really work very closely with artists. But I'm very interested in that tension, and I think that the ideas and the, and the objects often come together, but often we are, I know that we are presenting, for example, to our acquisitions group, often the most wild array of work from things that cost you know almost nothing to things that cost you know considerable amounts to work that is very ephemeral that we might not be able to uh, maintain for for years ahead and we just have to accept that to projects that are highly conceptual um but i think for us it's you know it goes back to the things that we talked about the the ideas that that's driving a project and what it speaks to at a particular moment but also for me we always go back to the context in which we're at. So we're not in a museum of modern art. And I think that makes the Art Institute very different. Mm -hmm. And we can draw on kind of centuries of artistic production. And we can also lean towards craft practices, the more handmade, but also industrial practice. And, and, industri and, and I think for me, what's so important about this is that this is so much more of the way that contemporary practitioners are working. Hmm. sort of mixing and borrowing from all kinds of methodologies and approaches but then very much creating their um, work that's resolutely their own that has a very strong point of view hmm. um, and for me it's you know it's you know to have that kind of um, sort of the, the the collection at our fingertips but a very broad art collection hmm. at our fingertips to really dig into to really be able to to borrow works from to show you know in the inner cloud exhibition you saw we borrowed um projects pre-colonial sculpture things that they were actually looking at hmm. um, and i think for me it's finding projects that make sense but also that benefit from being shown in a um in a museum like the art institute well, that seems like an unimprovable finale. Uh, I know we have a couple of other questions that came up there, which hopefully were spoken to to some extent, the important role of aesthetics. And uh, Brittany has made a great point about uh, acquisitions as permanent records of concepts, which I think is a great way of thinking about an acquisition program. And also other unwritten design histories as with the one that you documented in Mexico City. So a lot more to talk about. Um, I will just close by giving a little bit of a um, plug for our next two sessions, both of which have a lot to do with this intersection between the aesthetic and the conceptual. So on Wednesday, we're going to be speaking, continuing with our British theme, Zoe. We're going to be continuing with um, Faye Too Good, uh, who will be joining us on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we'll have Humberto Campana of the Campana Brothers. And um, apart from thanking you very much, Zoe, for- Oh, my pleasure. Well, Thank you for having for me. Yeah, great to have you here. And thanks everyone for joining in for your questions and for listening in. Uh